This needs to be said first and foremost. All views expressed in this video are my own, not necessarily shared with the creators of Digimon Digital Adventures, and this video is definitely not officially sponsored by them, Toei, Bandai, or anyone else with the rights to Digimon or the system at hand. So, it's been a while since I said I'd do this, but I have my reasons. I've been working on how to even get this out in a way that does the system justice, but I've also been waiting on the system itself to be play ready. However, now that Digimon Digital Adventures 1.4 is finally in a complete state, I'm going to sit here and talk about it. But uh, before we can get into that system specifically, I feel like I should probably answer a few questions for the uninitiated to both Digimon and tabletop role-playing games. If you're already familiar with both, you can skip this. Just skip to part two. That's the meat of it. But if you aren't, stick around. I'm going to give you a very, 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 very basic primer on uh, both of those things. There, there's a lot of different definitions for tabletop games, and uh, you might be best served doing your own research on that front if you want to know more outside of just the realms of this game. So if you're still here, I'm assuming you fall into one of the categories of either not knowing what a tabletop game is, or not knowing anything about Digimon beyond maybe a little bit of childhood nostalgia at best. If that's the case, then I'm glad you stuck around. I'll give you the best explanation I can for both regarding this system, but uh, again, if you want something more complete, you'd be better off looking around YouTube. There's tons of channels that talk about different types of tabletop role-playing games and they will probably give you a much better explanation than I could on general stuff. So what exactly is a tabletop role-playing game? Uh, called TTRPGs for short. That depends on the game you're talking about. Some games, like Dungeons & Dragons, tend to lean more towards combat, dungeon crawling, exploration, that sort of thing. While role-playing is a part of it, it's secondary to all of that, generally speaking. Other games, such as DDA, try to lean more into a narrative experience. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is you, as a player or a GM, which I will get to in a moment, are part of a group of people trying to all tell a story together. It's an experience called collective storytelling, and it's generally the focus of most modern tabletop games. I mean, even some people who play D&D do it. Uh, if you've heard of Critical Role, that's sort of what it is, though that's a little more scripted, apparently. I, I don't know. I'm not a big Critical Role guy. I'm the kind of guy who would rather play a game than watch somebody else play a game. I'm not bashing on it, so G Critical Role fanboys, don't, don't, don't get mad in the comments. Don't, don't, don't downvote the video. I'm not bashing it. I'm just saying it's not to my taste. Either way you slice it, tabletop role-playing games are basically you and your friends getting together and taking part in a fictional world that can be explored through the eyes of characters in that world, uh, played by you. Though the Game Master has a little more weight in that department. There are two types of people in tabletop role-playing game. There's the Game Master, who is sometimes called a Dungeon Master as a holdover from Dungeons & Dragons, which is usually shortened to GM or DM, and uh, I will probably be using those terms going forward, so... Remember that. The GM plays non-player characters, sets up the world and setting, uh, and basically has to give everyone else stuff to do and do most of the work for the players, or the other half. And the players, well, they play player characters, who are your way to influence the game world and interact with it. So, generally speaking, you'll have one GM and maybe three to five players. Uh, in my opinion, four players is about the most you want. Uh, it, after that, it just gets a little hectic and hard to keep track of everyone. Especially in narrative systems, where the spotlight needs to be passed around for everyone to have, you know, character development stuff. So that's just my personal advice, but uh, if you think you can handle more, or you don't think you can handle that many and you'd rather do less, go for it. So on top of needing people to play with and or run the game, you also need equipment. Uh, for Digimon Digital Adventures, that is a lot of D6 dice. I mean a lot. 
Granted, this was with some custom content the GM for the game I was in provided, as well as a lot of finagling with the mechanics, but at one point one of my Digimon rolled 76 dice in one attack. I think the highest you'll normally go is probably about 35. So with that in mind, what exactly is a D6? You know those dice you see in like Monopoly or other board games? Those are very primitive D6s. I call them primitive because the ones that are usually used for tabletop games are numbered rather than using dots. Picture on the screen right now. If you really want to spring for the fancy stuff, you can. There's hobby stores you can go to. There's a couple of sites online that basically serve the same purpose since, you know, everything's locked down right now. But if you ought to play online on a site such as Roll20 or Astral, if you can manage it, or, you know, Foundry Virtual Tabletop or Tabletop Simulator, anything like that, you don't even need to buy any dice. It's all digital, and you can just do it digitally, and personally, I would recommend that for Digimon Digital Adventures. Because you have to roll so many dice, it's a lot easier to have the computer do it for you, and everyone can see it. And it's fair, and you don't have to worry about anyone cheating or fudging dice. If you're playing in real life with other people, you can probably get graph paper in large scale or a whiteboard, something of the like, to make battle maps on the fly, or you can get a digital program such as Ill Winter's Floor Plan Generator, which is the one I recommend. It's on Steam, it's pretty cheap, has uh, workshop support, so, you know, easy to get stuff for, easy to mod. Definitely recommend if you make digital battle maps. If you're doing real life stuff, you're also going to need a pretty big table, you know, everyone needs room to roll, you need a room for your map, that sort of thing. I'm going to warn you, however, I do recommend digital play for Digimon Digital Adventures, because the dice numbers can get kind of silly, like I said. And if the game goes on long enough, players and non-players could will probably be rolling about 20 to 25 dice on average, and it can get kind of annoying. I already mentioned I rolled a lot, over 70 at one point. That was a really niche, not normal situation, so don't expect to roll that many. But do expect to roll around 30 by the end game if your game goes on for a long time. Like, mine's gone on for a year, almost. So if your games are going to be long term, well, well, we'll get to that in the next section. But, uh, yeah, you, you, you might want to uh, consider digital options. So with that, that's a very, very, very brief introduction to tabletop game. What you'll need to play Digimon Digital Adventures? That's the, I guess, technical side of things. Now we need to get to the other side, which is uh, a little more complicated. If you've made it this far, I I I'm assuming you still at least have some sort of nostalgia for Digimon, since you're obviously interested in this system. Uh, even if you don't, you know, enjoy anything that's been happening lately, uh, if you're watching just because, I guess you like my voice or something, thank you. Uh, I guess this is the point where I ask you if you really enjoy this kind of commentary. Like, subscribe, that sort of thing. Follow me on Twitter and Twitch. I stream Tuesdays and Thursdays. Shove that in here now. But for the uninitiated, this will be a very, 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 very brief summary of Digimon as a franchise the themes and ideas that apply to Digimon Digital Adventures, and a uh, little advice on where to go if you want to know a little bit more without having to sit through two decades of anime. So, going back to that, right out of the gate, this is going to be very brief. If you want something a little bit more, uh, I would recommend checking out Wikimon for general Digimon information and... Maybe getting your hands on the original Japanese version of at least the first season of the anime with English subs or whatever language subs you speak, if you can, that is. Or, you know, if you know Japanese, just watch it. I'd also recommend the YouTuber Billiam, who has done a full overview of at least the dubbed versions. I'm not sure if you watched the subbed versions. Uh, but you can check out his entire retrospective in the link in the description, and I like his stuff. So I'd recommend giving him a subscription, too, because he's just awesome. With the shilling out of the way, let's move on. Digimon, short for Digital Monsters, started out as a clone of Tamagotchis, which were little virtual pets you could care for and then make them fight each other. Eventually, it blew up, got an anime, and a bunch of other games, and I think a manga, 
Vtamer01. Not sure when that started, but I've read it and it's pretty good. Uh, but most people in the West know it from the anime. Because everyone compared it to Pokemon, which is not a great comparison. Because they're sort of different things thematically, but we'll get to that. In America, the anime was just known as Digimon Digital Monsters, though in Japan it was known as Digimon Adventure. The story was about seven kids who were teleported into another world at summer camp. That's right, bitches. Digimon was the original Isekai. And don't you forget it. And they were forced to fight evil Digimon with their new Digimon partners. And uh, only by exemplifying specific qualities about themselves were they able to help their Digimon grow and fight to their strongest levels. It was successful, so it spawned a sequel series, which was known as... Well, Digimon. Still in the West. Whereas in... Japan, it was known as Digimon Adventure Zero Two. Then there was Digimon Tamers, or just, again, Digimon again in the West. Then you had the fourth series, which was just, again, known as Digimon in the West, but known as Digimon Frontier in Japan, where they actually became the Digimon, which was sort of a weird Sentai thing. And then you have Digimon Savers, which was known as Data Squad in the West, and that sort of killed Digimon in the West for a while. Then they made the season Digimon Cross Wars, which was known as Digimon Fusion in America, and I don't think we got any more adaptations after that. There was also Digimon Adventure Try, Digimon Adventure Kizuna, which was a feature-length movie that was released recently. And then in Japan, we had Digimon Universe Aptly Monsters, which was sort of a spin-off. And currently, there is a running reboot of the original anime called Digimon Adventure... Digivice? Colon? Psy? It's got a lot of names, and I don't know which one's the correct one, but, uh, yeah, it, it's currently airing, you know, it's worth a watch, I guess. One of the big connecting threads for every anime, or at least most of them, is that the characters are either going through a coming-of-age story or learning something about themselves, and, you know, changing, getting better. And uh, that's because in most of them, the Digimon partner serves as either a complement or a contrast to the human. Since DDA is heavily influenced by how the anime plays out, I would highly recommend you at least give the original Digimon Adventure a watch, dubbed or subbed really, because they're both fine. Definitely give it a watch if you can get your hands on it, especially if you have no experience with the franchise beyond surface level or memories from being a kid. It'll be important if you're going to play DDA. Again, this was a very brief and surface level summary. If you want to know more, watch Billiam's video on the different seasons of the anime and give the f at least the first season Digimon Adventure a watch in the original Japanese. The actual introduction section of Digimon Digital Adventures basically goes over what I've gone over in this video. There's a little more detail, but read the book anyways. I definitely recommend if you're going to play any tabletop game, read the book. Learn the system. Know what you're doing because that will pay dividends down the line and also make your GM not get upset. Other than that, uh, that's basically it for this video. Again, this is just a short introduction. Uh, thanks for sticking around. Again, if you liked it, subscribe for more. There's going to be more coming down the line over the next few weeks. Uh, follow me on Twitch, where I stream Tuesdays and Thursdays. Follow me on Twitter to know if there's anything up with the streams, like if I'm going to be missing one to work on something or for another reason. But uh, this is the end of the brief introduction. Next time, we're going to be discussing how to create human characters in Digimon Digital Adventures.